strange times we're living in, but some things don't change like death and taxes. Now you plan or put in money to avoid taxes or sidestep for a while, but a will is the final voice of that person, the final wishes, but more and more people named in the will or not named in the will will be arguing over their rights. And it's no secret that in Windsor, Essex County, we have had a housing explosion as we've never seen before. Remember when we used to laugh at the people in Toronto and London and how much they pay for their homes and yeah, well, who's laughing now? <laughs> so welcome to a senior's view. It's very clear that I am not the same senior that my parents were and they were not the same seniors that their parents were. As the world rotates faster and faster, we are faced a multitude of people and places and things our parents or grandparents never had to deal with and never had to think about, but now we have to. So I'm Lori Baldassi, and again, welcome to A Senior View. And let's get right to our guests. Mustafa Sinjari from Manor Realtor. Mustafa has a passion for real estate and helping clients achieve the best possible outcome in every situation. He is a conscientious realtor who exudes credibility, commitment, and determination. Mustafa has appeared on Manor's top producer list repeatedly. Welcome, Mustafa. We also have Ashley Harmon. Ashley has appeared as a guest lecturer at the University of Windsor Faculty of Law and a presenter for Ontario Trial Lawyers Association webinar. Ashley earned her Juris Doctor degree and Bachelor of Arts in Psychology from the University of Windsor. While in law school, she was awarded the Samia Rose Shaheen Memorial Award for Legal Writing. As she has appeared as a guest lecturer at the University of Windsor Faculty of Law and a presenter for an Ontario Trial Lawyers Association, as she has earned her Juris Doctor degree, and welcome Ashley. And last but not least, we have a Rotarian International benefactor, a Paul Harris Rotarian and past president of the Windsor Roseland Rotary Club. She currently sits on the University of Windsor Board of Governors and is vice chair of both their investment and pension committees. She has been awarded the Windsor District Chamber of Commerce for both entrepreneurial recognition and the Best Business Awards. She has a doctorate of law degree. She is highly recognized across Canada in the insurance financial field and has been in the industry top producer, top producer for over 30 years. She is a past chair of the Windsor and Essex County Development Commission. She is Pat Sulier. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. Now, we're going to start the show to explain everyone's role here. Clearly, Mustafa is going to talk about real estate. And Ashley is going to talk about what happens when with a will and things like that. And we have Pat to talk about finances. So right now, let's talk about the biggest burning question, and that's the real estate market in Windsor. So Mustafa, I'm a senior or I'm an empty nester. Do I sell my house right now? Absolutely. Right now, the market is very hot and it's a great time to sell. A lot of seniors will definitely sell and downsize because they don't have to do the maintenance and the upkeep of the houses. I, I know that right now, like the market is really hot, but if you sell high, don't you have to expect to buy high? Well, right now, yes. However, a lot of seniors, they really don't like to stay here for longer than six months. They'll go to Florida, travel, use that equity that they have that since they bought maybe 20 years ago or 30 years ago, and the prices have increased about 10 times higher than what they paid. So um, in this climate, I don't think ever before you have more adult children moving home. So if my adult children move home, do I buy a, a bigger house and put their name on it? Or do I add to my house? Like what... What should I, or should I just, you know, leave as is? It is better to add an addition if possible, if the permits are there and are allowed. Uh, the reason why is definitely if the house is clear, it'll definitely be easier to get a equity line of credit mm -hmm. to use that to add an addition. Now, when people move, they call them hidden costs, but they're really not hidden. Name the costs that are associated with selling your house. Selling your house, the cost would be the lawyers, the movers, 
the property taxes. Is there a land transfer oh, tax? There is a now? land transfer land tax. Land transfer yes. tax. I know that, you know, movers will say, okay, your house is this big, it's this price. How do you figure out the land transfer? Because that's different. Isn't that a percentage? So I know that it's 3%. For the first five, and then it goes, and then it, it goes in increments as, as you, the price of your house. Now, when you say taxes, are you talking about the tax that is associated with selling your house or the taxes on the property? No, when you sell your house, it is tax free. Definitely if it's your only your primary residence. Right. So if it is your primary residence, you do not have to pay taxes. So a lot of seniors will take that advantage because it's tax free. And it is better than the stocks. What about when I buy a house? So the cost to buy would be lawyer fees again, as well as moving, land transfer tax, uh, and property tax, and then some adjustments as well. Do you see this market settling down anytime soon? Right now, the market is going up. And the reason why is the supply and demand. And the demand is very high. Definitely with all the new immigrants and people moving. Is there a lot of land development going on around Windsor, Essex County? Yes, there is. There's lots. Uh, (laughs) However, it is very slow. COVID kind of did slow that down and the materials as well and the shortage of lumber as well as electrical panels, windows, etc. A lot of builders are having a harder time to find suppliers to bring all that in right now. Now we, we've we decided to expand our house, our adult children, our home. Let's talk to Ashley about, do I put my children's name on that house? Because really they're going to inherit it and I get to sidestep a tax if I do that, correct? That's a great question, Lori. And it's probably one of the most common questions I get. I will never give an answer to a question like that that's one size fits all because it's not one size fits all advice. And I do want to know a lot of information about somebody's family, tax status, and living circumstances before I answer that kind of question. But what I can tell you is for the majority of people, it works out as not a great strategy. And to understand why we first look at Why are people thinking this is a good strategy in the first place? Usually they're trying to avoid a tax colloquially referred to as the probate tax, Mm -hmm. which is really the Ontario Estate Administration tax. And it's a rather low tax. If you're looking at a $500,000 house, the tax uh, at the probate stage is going to be about $7,500, which isn't a huge amount. What can happen when we put our houses in the joint names of our children is we put ourselves up for a number of risks. One of those would be that we open up the possibility of a capital gains tax because as the person living in the house, you have a primary residence exemption that could be exempting the increased equity in that house from being taxable when you sell it. By having your child on the house, if they don't live there and they have a separate primary residence that they're claiming, um, you're jeopardizing that full exemption at the time that you eventually sell the house. A couple of other issues that I've seen arise when people put their children on their house title is the child gets a divorce and the house gets brought into the divorce proceedings and the court may order that the house be sold or not be sold during those proceedings. Another thing that can happen is the parent goes into financial difficulty at some stage in the future or decides to sell the house and the child will not sign off on that sale. The child could be sued or go into bankruptcy and have their share of that house offered up to creditors in the course of those proceedings. Lastly, and what most people think is the most unlikely scenario, is a family dispute. I have never had a parent come to my office to plan their will and expect that their children will fight when they pass, yet many children do, in -hmm. fact, uh, enter into arguments after their parent has died. So if you do have multiple children and you choose to place the home in the name of one child, you are leaving that child open to a number of disputes as well as the other children. So those are some of the considerations that I give clients Uh, There are ways to mitigate those various concerns that each person can discuss with their lawyer if they are very adamant about planning their estate in this way. Uh, So it's something that, again, is very case specific. But these are things that often aren't being talked about in casual conversations where people are receiving the advice from a friend 
or a family member uh, about how title in their home should be held. Now, if we're talking about parents that put their children's names on their homes, as people age and they lose, you know, their faculties or whatever, we all know it because of Britney Spears' conservatorship, but that's not what it's called in Canada. It's called guardianship. Does that where the similarity ends? That's right. We do have a concept called guardianship in Ontario, And when I sit down with someone to plan their estate, there's actually two aspects to planning your estate. And one of the aspects is often overlooked, and that's incapacity planning. So at the time when you plan your will and your estate, and the younger the better, because you want to do it while you still have your wits about Mm -hmm. you and you still have capacity, you need to have two conversations with your lawyer. One is, what will happen when I die? And the other is, what will happen if I lose my mental capacity, if I have dementia in the future, or I'm in a car accident and I'm in a coma and I can't make my own decisions. There are documents that we can put in place uh, that will provide for what will happen in those scenarios, such as a power of attorney for property, a power of attorney for personal care. And that allows someone to manage your affairs for you if you become incapable. Those documents are very affordable to create and they, it's, it's one of the situations where a pinch of prevention, pound of cure type mm-hmm. of thing. If you do fail to capacity plan and you do not have a power of attorney and you become incapable at some point, your family is in the unfortunate position of having to apply to the court to become your guardian in order to manage any of your affairs. Those applications, and I do them frequently, take months. They cost thousands of dollars. Property is often frozen while the uh, application progresses. Family members, again, can dispute, which isn't often the case. They're normally uncontested, but even the uncontested applications take months and cost thousands, Mm -hmm. and then the guardian has to return to court, usually, in my experience, every three years to account to the court for their actions. The PGT, Public Guardian and Trustee, also oversees the guardian's actions, and Lastly, the guardian usually has to post a bond to the court in order to manage the affairs. All of those costs come out of your estate as the incapable person and are mm-hmm. paid by you. And these are can add up over the years to tens of thousands of dollars that can be avoided by simply having a power of attorney. We have uh, a number of titles here. We have the, the guardian, the uh, executor. Now, the power of attorney... Does that go with the executor or how does how does that play out? Thank you, Lori. These are good <laughs> questions because this is probably the second most common question I get asked. And we often get people who come to the office and say, my mother passed away, but I'm her power of attorney. So there's a lot of confusion about terms. And to simplify it, what I always tell people is your power of attorney matters while you're alive. And whoever you name as your attorney has authority over your affairs while you're alive and that power of attorney paper remains in place. Same with a guardianship. If the court names someone as your guardian, that person has authority over your affairs while you're alive. The moment you pass away, no power of attorney or guardian has any more authority over your affairs and their authority is frozen and now an executor must be appointed. So you can name the same person in your power of attorney and in your will. And to clarify, the executor is appointed either by your will or by the court if you don't have a will. And that person takes over when you pass away. That can be the same person. And in often cases, it's a different person as well. And the dividing line is whether the person who's the subject of the will or power of attorney is alive or, or passed away. When all these complications happen, a tsunami of emotions when someone dies is what's happening. And then everybody's getting a lawyer and then just the bills just start to go up and you're fighting over things you never ever thought you would fight about. So in those cases, when it gets tenuous between family members and the I'm the executor, does the power attorney, doesn't that die with the person? Like you're, you're done, uh, your role when that person dies? Yes, your role as power of attorney dies with the person. However, if the executor or other family members notice after the person has passed away 
that uh, strange things were happening in the financial affairs while you were managing or while the power of attorney was in place, the power of attorney can be called to court after the death to account for the Mm -hmm. financial transactions Mm -hmm. that they authorized. Mm -hmm. And people always, you know, I know friends that have said, oh, I'm not the power of attorney and I'm so hurt and I'm so upset. And I said, it's such a job. You don't want it. People don't understand what goes into being the executor of a state? Can you just quickly give us an overview? I always tell my clients the time to express that you love your children equally is in the gifting section of your will, not in the appointment of executor section of your will. You pick your executor or your power of attorney based on who you want to give the most homework to. Or sometimes I say the child you like least. <laughs> your most responsible <laughs> yeah. child, yeah. definitely. Or... Sometimes none of your children are appropriate and you're picking a nephew who's an accountant or a niece who's a lawyer. You want to pick somebody who's great with numbers because it's all about financial records. All the transactions need to be monitored. Somebody who's great with following up, making appointments, making phone calls, because your executor is going to be locating all of your paperwork, canceling all of your bills, gathering all of your assets, paying all of your creditors, speaking with lawyers, speaking with accountants, paying taxes, sending letters. It's a very detail-oriented position. It's not for somebody who doesn't even file their own taxes (laughs) on time. You do want to pick somebody who has a natural flair for organization and accounting. And remember that uh, when you're appointing multiple people, Sometimes it can cause wires to get crossed and it can cause even more difficulty with getting those tasks done. We've sold our house, we've done our will, we got a little cash and we're over to Pat. What am I doing with this money, Pat? Well, um, now you've come to me and uh, and it's different strokes for different folks. Like every uh, everyone has a different story. So what we have at staff is we have a financial planner. Uh, we have a couple of them as a matter of fact. And then we have them uh, find out everything they can about you that's pertinent to where your goals and objectives are for the future. People who have sold their home, if they haven't bought another one with that money, maybe they're going into a con or going into an apartment or something. I mean, why do they have this money? Uh, Maybe they've downsized, okay? And so now they have the money to do other things with. I guess there's many questions that... We need to know about it. We need to know, are you healthy? Um, Is your spouse healthy? Your children healthy? Do you have a, are you still responsible for children at home? Um, Do you want to fund your grandchildren? I mean, questions will come out of the information that we get from the, from the financial planner. What are your travel plans? Do you want to buy a car every three years, five years? And, um, you know, just how much money do you have to invest? Do you want to put it into your RRSP? Qualify getting your tax back as much as you can for that year? What room you have in your RSP? And or do you want to put in your tax-free savings account? So you know that when you do want to travel and buy that new car down the road and a condo or whatever, you have that money uh, sitting there, if you haven't already done it, max your RSP or your TFSA, then um, that money grows and it tax shelters and you never have to pay tax on it. And there's always, if you do take money out of that TFSA, there's a hole that you can always plug, not in the same year that you took it out, but in the following year. People like to, if we're talking to over age 60, uh, want to maybe fund their grandchildren's education plans. If the children's parents have not funded it or not fully funded it, grandparents can fund in as much as uh, is allowed uh, for that period of time. Mm-hmm. Then we look at other monies. What's your risk tolerance? Uh, is it important to put money in that you want to make sure it goes off to your children? Uh, we have what is called segregated funds. Some people out there or people that don't know much about segregated funds say, that work in other financial institutions will say um, they're too expensive, but believe me, they're not too expensive. If someone passes away and the costs that are associated, say, with mutual funds or stock market or whatever, versus the segregated funds that go directly on to the children. But there are also times when they should go directly onto the children or the grandchildren or funding different things for the family directly bypassing the estate. But Ashley will also tell you, which is, which is right, 
that sometimes they need to have that money going into the estate uh, so they have the money there to fund other things or in another way, right? My kids need their inheritance now. Is touching my money that I've put away costly, like am I going to have to pay taxes or penalties or any of those things, to, I believe, you can gift, you can do a gift for your children financially. Is that a, like a one-time thing or is it just too costly to do? There are, there are different ways of doing gifts. However, it is very costly. It's, it's a costly situation, especially if the money is needed for retirement down the road mm-hmm. because you've lost the growth on that money for your retirement. And in that future loss could be quite a bit, let's say between your 60s and 70s when you maybe want to take that money. So again, um, there's a lot of different things for different people and maybe this is not important to you, the loss of that growth on the money, because you've taken care of it in other ways. Mm -hmm. Um, We look at and say, um, what are the health issues on the side of maybe a child? Again, are you supporting a child? Or um, are you robbing the child of his or her on the more subtle side? A lot of people don't think of that. Are you robbing that child uh, of their self-worth or uh, the future feelings of accomplishment? If you, it's sometimes, you know, uh, making it too easy for them. It's hard to, to watch sometimes, but however, it's the right thing to do. But then if everything, if you're doing it for all the right reasons, then by all means, give them the money and, and let them uh, or have the enjoyment of really what they're using that money for. And so maybe it'll downsize the tax burden of the parents or... Uh, And then the children will be in a lower tax bracket, you know, so there's different things to consider there. And also there are ways of uh, setting up a a plan for the child in the future that maybe you set it up now and they get it in the future more tax effectively, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say if you're in a business or whatever, you might be transferring money over to the children, transferring a business over to the children, whatever, uh, where you'll be in a future lower tax position, when you had planned to to transfer that uh, business over to the child, right? So again, this is where the retirement financial planner comes in. And by the time uh, we're working together and we have all those answers and we can do the right thing for the client. What kind of estate planning should I do when I'm leaving money to my grandchildren? Now, I'm going to preface this by saying we live in a world of blended families. Mm-hmm. So that's a very you know, emotional tightrope to walk when, you know, the parents were married for 25 years, but it was a blended family. So you're, there's really no steps here. We're all one family, but that's not what happens when uh, a will is read. So I'm going to let you and Pat answer uh, how you manage to walk that tightrope. And I'd like Ashley to comment on how you deal with, I got left out or she, he or she got more than me type of question. So Pat, I'm going to start with you. Well, Ashley and I would come across marriages that maybe are three and four times. Again, uh, yes. Some of them are very complicated cases. But people make things complicated. We can uncomplicate them. In my case, I've always felt that like parenting and education have always been at the top of my list. And uh, so from my perspective and in my will and estate planning, I first calculated uh, in an inflationary um, percentage of how much was needed to put away for each grandchild's education. I've done my job as far as a parent can do. Now they're more on their own, but once a parent, you're always a parent, right? Above all, I contributed to all of their RESPs uh, to give a base for those RESPs. And any balances that are, my will takes care of that, that aren't taken down the road, that are paid to them in their at age 30, 35, let's say. So again, um, when we're thinking of the grandchildren, I separated my will up in percentages. So percentages that go off to the education. Um, I have seven great-grandchildren. Oh, you'll be working a long time. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Ranging from ages two to to 11. And uh, they have great parents. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I know that everything is being dealt with responsibly, I don't see any divorces happening there, but you never know. Mm -hmm. And so I always make sure that money goes directly to, uh, say, Persterpes from 
uh, from a parent to a grandchild. But this also is with information collected from the parents before you before you do any of this kind of planning. Do you like the daughter-in-law? Do you like the son-in-law? Do you want your grandchildren getting the money directly? Do you want them getting it directly with the daughter-in-law or son-in-law as the trustee, okay? And so all important questions are because everybody has a different story. And then again, you're dealing with if that person, if the father of that person now is married to somebody else, and what is the, what is the father's will say? Or where is that money going to end up? So you want it per stirpes to that child to be paid out over a period of time. With the products I sell, I can do all of that, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, in the right directly in the planning. But then it gets um, to other confusions that come into the case and sometimes like someone like Ashley has to you have to work closely with the lawyer to make sure that we're both doing the right thing for the family. Ashley I'm sure you've had this you know it's it's a common place for multiple marriages blended families so how do you walk that line to uh, she left more of a percentage to you than she did to me and fighting the wills it I Growing up, I never heard of anybody fighting a will. Now it's just common. What are the things to, to avoid? Well, I think Pat hit the nail on the head when she said everyone has a different story. And I think what everybody ought to be doing at the front end of their estate plan is having a very thorough conversation with their lawyer, setting up the family tree first. And your lawyer should understand any of the family dynamics that go into it, blood relatives, stepchildren, second, third, husbands and wives. It's important for the lawyer to understand all of that background and then understand what you, the testator, intends to happen. And Pat brought up the word per stirpes. um, And when we talk about per stirpes, we're talking about the what ifs. So what if my child dies, who then should receive their portion? And so it's important to to get an idea of the family tree and then talk about the intention and then talk about all of the possible what ifs. In my office, I have a huge whiteboard in my um, conference room and we will often draw out the way the estate is going to go and the percentages where they'll go in first instance, and we can cross people out and show where that would go if so-and-so passes away before you. The other thing to consider is dependent claims. So whenever I have a blended family estate plan, my first and foremost is to understand what kind of spousal support or child support obligations may arise, because as the lawyer, you have an obligation to make sure those are addressed in the will. So again, each family is just incredibly unique and also leading to what Pat said earlier. It's important for the lawyer to know what estate planning strategies you've already undertaken outside of your will. So if you have specific funds that are earmarked with beneficiaries on them, or if you have certain tax strategies uh, in terms of how you structured your finances already, the lawyer needs to know that so that they can work around it and make sure that it fits into the whole puzzle. And so, yes, looking at the family tree, looking at the whole financial picture, often my clients think I'm being very nosy at the beginning, but really I'm just trying to make sure that there's no confusion at the end. If there was a will challenge, those lawyer's notes would be produced for the court. And so if your lawyer has taken that full background and made notes of what your intentions were, It's very rare for the court to overturn something that was done intentionally, whatever your reasons were. It's more likely the court would overturn a will if they felt that the lawyer misunderstood you or didn't follow your instructions in the drafting of the will, or if obviously the testator didn't have capacity to give the instructions. So if those notes are thorough and a full planning session has been done, your, your estate should be pretty clear and pretty iron clad Mm -hmm. for any sort of will challenge that might arise. Mm -hmm. Now, you would think that the financial advisor, you could have your financial advisor know who your lawyer is to work in tandem together, but does that happen on a regular basis? 
Well, it should. In our office, the accountant and lawyer are key to the team of the client. And most of my clients are professionals and business people. Um, people that have been in businesses for years mm-hmm. out there in the manufacturing and that, and now we're looking after second and third generations, right, mm-hmm. of them, because they want to come to someone who's knowledgeable. It's funny, right. you think that they'd want to sometimes go off to someone their own age or whatever, you mm-hmm. know, but they don't. They come to us and they come to me because of the knowledge and mm-hmm. working with the family. And of course, I know the generations, right? Ashley, um, do you have experience, like, is that starting to be commonplace where the financial advisor and the lawyer are getting together to talk. Uh, Have you had that experience? The third question I think on my intake form is who the financial planner is. Mm -hmm. I don't think that the financial planner will necessarily know what lawyer the client chooses unless the lawyer asks for the introduction because often the financial planner is involved long before a lawyer becomes involved. So I see it as something... Uh, that I should be asking each time a client comes in, in terms of what kind of um, financial planner or account manager you have at the bank. I ask for a full detail of, again, all your assets. If there's just a couple of accounts, you know, a checking, a savings, and an RSP, I don't necessarily need to have a full conversation with that person. I do usually make a short introduction If there are a lot of accounts and there's a complex structure of how those accounts are set up, and also if the client cannot recall whether beneficiary forms were signed for certain accounts, I will usually reach out to the financial advisor and have a discussion to make sure that we are on the same page in terms of the client's plans for their estate plan. Let's go back to Mustafa for a bit and the selling of the house because... um, When you sell a house, most people go in and say, you know, we have to paint, we have to make it look pretty, to add more value to it. What adds value to a home to sell? Is it just, so if I put in a pool and a jacuzzi, is it going to make the price go up? No. Uh, To add a pool and a jacuzzi, really, you don't get the value back into the house, Mm -hmm. necessarily, they say. What adds value is the kitchen and the bathrooms. The updated uh, kitchen as well as the updated bathrooms are the ones that bring your value the highest. What about all these uh, companies that are staging homes? Is it worth it to me to have my home staged? Absolutely. Staging kind of brings the reality of what if I want to live in that house? Now, it all just depends on how much furniture and what you need. A lot of times that it will bring you an extra twenty to $30,000 to the house and it brings more value to it. Just the kitchens and the bathrooms, it doesn't matter if your garden is uh, picture perfect. Those things don't really count or curb appeal, as they say. Cur- curb appeal is big as well. You want to make sure that it looks really nice from the outside. Uh, mm-hmm. And the reason why is the first picture is the main thing that you really want. Uh, definitely when everyone now is looking online, kind of looking at the photos and the first thing they see, if, if the photo looks good, then they'll start clicking and keep going. But if the photo looks bad, they won't even bother and they'll just go to the next house. Do you find that more people are buying homes online than ever before? Yes. So there is a lot of out of towners that will look online, look at the photos They'll call the realtor. There's also a lot of the virtual tours. And definitely because of the whole COVID and the restrictions, it is a bit easier to buy online. But they do come and look at the house. I wanted to bring up adding value to the house because you talked about you have clients that own businesses, Pat, for years Mm -hmm. and years and years. So it's kind of the same thing. That business is a house. Oh, it is. And people, you know, some kids go into the business and grow it and do really well. Some just take that job. Some don't have anything to do with the business. So you're taking care of that financial aspect of it, making sure that there's a succession plan. So if I've never worked in the business and you can't gift the business, I'm sure, um, how, how does it work that they finally take over this business? Is it, uh, do they come to you first and say, okay, we're going to hand over 
you know, uh, the, the control of the business? And do they go to Ashley next and say, okay, uh, just get handed over? Like, how does that work? A lot of businesses are heritage businesses in this city. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I think it was Henry Ford said the first, uh, the first generation (laughs) builds it. The second generation grows it and the third generation destroys it. So I, I can't really say I know a lot of businesses that family businesses that that's happened to, because I've seen that the third generation has taken it in a whole new direction. So, you know, does the second generation, um, do they just go, okay, you know, it was your grandfather's business, it was mine, now it's yours? Like, how does that, how does that machine work? Well, I could write a book, okay, on what's happened in businesses, okay? Um, but of course, and I can think back of so many things, but we deal in a very sensitive, mm-hmm. uh, private uh, because like I, that's area, why I said right? it, it's like a home. Mm-hmm. It, it was built from the ground up. People live their lives oh. there. They they made their livelihood there. Well, I'm just thinking of one right now. I, I, I've thought of mm-hmm. quite a few actually as you're talking there. But there's one up, um, not in the Windsor area, but outside of Toronto. And and one time he called me in and he wanted to sit with his uh, with his uh, three sons and the wives. And I met with the family around the table and, uh, and his wife and himself. Now, his wife and himself started building that business, and then she became a homemaker and a mother, and, and, uh, and he went on to build the business. And now it was time for him to now do his will planning, figure out what he wanted to do with his business, etc. And because we have the training that we do, I was sat in the boardroom, and, and we went through everything, what were his wishes that he wanted to discuss in front of his children. He was being very open. And I could see the body language of one of the wives of the sons, okay? And the next day he called me or the day after and uh, back in the office, and he said, Pat, I have this problem, and I want to discuss it with you. And he started into it, and I said, I will tell you right now what your problem is. It is son sees wife. Yes, how did you know that? I could tell by her body language at the table that something she thought was not fair. So maybe it would have been better off just to have your sons and not their wives, okay? And um, but you were very generous, right? And and etc. So um, it went on, and actually she became a big problem, and the son became a problem that tore the family apart, and it was really sad. And another one of one of my Alberta clients, um, Alberta Canada, had a daughter in. And uh, he was trying to put all of his stuff together, and his wife had passed away of cancer, and she was a smoker. And the father said, if any one of you children smoke, you will not be in my will. And so I had his daughter, a Michigan license, so I had his daughter over in Michigan. She promised me that she would stop smoking, and I was able to get some insurance on her that was quite unique, that if you stop smoking within three years' time, then I could get that same policy take the smoking off it with no further medical evidence. And it was something that was out at that time. And somehow she lied to her dad. And I was working also with another advisor out in Alberta, in Calgary. And, um, and he ended up finding out that she lied. And he wasn't very happy with us either. Even though I explained what this policy was all about. But she had lied to him. So he took them all on a cruise. And he laid the law down. And, uh, and you know what? She never, ever stopped smoking. And she didn't get part, the part of the will. He stuck to his guns. Mm-hmm. Uh, another one where the father thought the son was just really the greatest, because, you know, a lot of my clients came over in the 50s. They had, uh, you know, 25 bucks in their pocket or whatever, you know, and, and they had to find a way. They didn't get all the government benefits that you get today. They had to find a way, and they became very, very successful. They might have ended up in Saskatchewan in the fields or wanted to start off with, and then, ending, and then ended up, or started there, and then ended up uh, building a huge manufacturing plant, mm-hmm. okay? And so then when the bad times came, let's say in 2007, 8, then that child who he bragged about having his MBA and always oh, so smart, etc., came into the business, started expanding into a 
building another building and doing this and that. And then when the hard times came, they did not know how to react to the hard times and keep up the relationships with their uh, contracts, say the big Ford contracts, General Motors contracts, etc. cetera. Uh, then I have other families that have succeeded. Um, I'm in third generation with one. I'm second generation who runs a company now. Back in years when I was doing um, past service pension planning, I was able to take out several million dollars out of this company on behalf of partners. And their accountant had told them that they couldn't do it, that he was told they couldn't do it. And it came across, and it seemed like a simple problem to me because I was doing a lot of that across Canada. And so it was hard to get through the gatekeeper. And once I found out from the lawyer or the accountant, mm-hmm. um, I was able to get the gatekeeper to let me in. I said she would be a hero. Won't she let me in? And I had this story to tell them, and I was able to really help them out a lot. So that now brought on the second generation, which I've done a lot for them, and now the third is coming in. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's it, there's remarkable stories out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's a lot of contentious situations that I'm sure Ashley can speak to. And even Mustafa, you can probably speak to when the people are bidding for houses. I'm sure they, it, they, it gets emotionally charged. Do you, Ashley, you want to talk about some of that? Yeah, well, when you're dealing with a family business, um, I think you have to have a team of people, similar to what Pat said, brainstorming with you in terms of what's the best strategy for the business, How is this business going to be passed along? As the lawyer, I'm always concerned about tax consequences of certain strategies in terms of passing along a business. So it's important to have the right people involved to uh, determine those tax consequences and predict the tax consequences. So you want a very good business accountant on board um, and you definitely want to make sure that there are discussions that are had in privacy too. Because sometimes when the children are in the room, as the lawyer, I don't like the children to be in the room when someone is making a decision about what to do with their business or their estate or their home because people will change what they will say in front of their kids because they want to keep their kids happy and make sure their kids love them. And you have to be able to have some really frank and tough discussions with people. Is your child going to run your business into the ground? Would you be better off selling it? to the highest bidder and seeing the value out of that and giving the value of that to your kids. So these are the really tough discussions that you have to be prepared to have with your team. And the key to avoiding the fights is to have those really uncomfortable conversations early and often and confront all the possibilities and plan for all those possibilities. So that would be my advice. And speaking to the cross-border issues that come up, It's always important to consider that when you're talking about tax too, because one of the most common things I'm seeing now is many of my clients have adult children living and working in the States, and there are very serious tax consequences to contend with there in terms of gift tax and other residential taxes that they can incur. So your plan needs to work for you. Sometimes it also needs to be checked on the other end, by uh, an accountant in the States to make sure that your plan works for your children as well. Now, Mustafa, do you have any advice for people who are putting in a bid for a home and not to get into these huge bidding wars? Well, it is very, very emotional as well as it is very challenging sometimes when there is like 10 to 15 offers. Um, But at the end of the day, it's really on what the person really thinks that property is worth and what they're willing to pay and if they see themselves in that house. Mm -hmm. Uh, A lot of times the buyer will write a letter about the home and kind of seeing why they like the house as well. um, And that kind of helps sometimes. We are not the seniors or the grandparents that our parents were, as I said at the top of the show. And... Flipping houses is not only, you know, reality shows, it's reality here because a lot of people have taken early retirement because they listened to Pat and they've (laughs) invested their money and now they're bored. So what's your thoughts on flipping homes? So basically the thought of flipping homes right now is always great. However, there is becomes costly if you don't do it yourselves. However, a lot of seniors They are retired. They'll take their time. The interest rates are very low right now as well. So 
for someone to come in, fix up the house, put some paint on it. There is some good value to doing that. So selling now is a really good idea and not holding on to it. Yeah, it's a good idea. So when people flip houses, Ashley, what are the legal costs attached to flipping a house? I think people should consider the fact that if it is not their primary residence, if they're not living in the house while they're flipping it, they're going to be paying capital gains tax on any value they add. So at the time you're projecting the cost that it's going to take for the renovations, you're going to want to subtract that from your projected profit. And then, of course, you've still got your land transfer taxes and your real estate fees for doing the transactions, the purchase and the sale, plus your realtor fees. So that should be something that's all built in on the front end before you even make an offer on the property. As you said, we have uh, people that have taken early retirement, you know, they're flipping homes and things like that. Now, Pat, here's the perfect question. When do I take my CPP? Ah, well, um, that's uh, different for everyone. So for instance, um, First, you mean, well, first you would go see a retirement planner, right? And then it will assess your particular situation, answer any questions that you have, and set you on a clear path moving forward. So normally, if you're still working and have enough to have a nice lifestyle, uh, you may wish to just leave your payments and collect them at a later date, before the age of 71. But always remember, whenever you do, if you're still working, and now you're collecting your CPP, you're going to pay tax on that money. But not only that, a lot of people don't realize that it actually might put you up into a higher tax bracket on most of your money, okay? So then you would leave it uh, working for you. Now, because if you leave it and uh, it's uh, projected out to give you um, a lot more, say, in 10 years, okay, if someone uh, decide not to take it at age 60, that seems to be the, the age that people say, I'm going to start taking that, you know. But they don't, they don't think about what the cost to them down the road would be. And another thing is that if you, if you wish to maybe just ma- use those payments to maximize a larger amount of money to go to your children and grandchildren down the road, then and you're healthy then you would take those payments and you would put them into a life insurance policy. And that will maximize your estate down the road. Or if you predecease, say age 70, maybe your wife needs some uh, needs some uh, more money to make up for pension loss or money that you don't have because, uh, well, maybe a good example there is pension loss. You might be leaving 66 and two-thirds or 50% to your spouse but she was used to having more of that money. So there's all kinds of things. Again, everybody has a different story. So let's leave it on that note. Got a little information about financial planning. We've got some information Mm -hmm. about wills. Thank you, Mustafa. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Pat. And let's just end that for now for this show. And I'd just like to say one thing, and I'd like to direct this to the millennials. I had to live through avocado appliances and carpeting so you could have stainless steel and granite countertops. You're welcome. I'm Lori Baldassi, and this is A Senior View. Production staff, Lois Rinlisbacher. This podcast was produced by Sikander Salim. Thank you.